So when uh, Shamir was talking, I had this, uh, you know, moment where I froze and I said, hey, wait a minute, am I an optimistic uh, digital rights activist or am I one of those uh, completely pessimistic uh, feminist activists who finds a problem everywhere, you know, whether, you know, it's the architecture of this room or the number of male participants or whatever. And um, I think that what is important uh, is I have to lay out first what is the perspective or what is the lens through which I'm going to make four or five points. And um, what I'm coming from is uh, how many of you in the room have watched Charlie Chaplin's Modern Times? Well, the rest have to watch it. So I'm coming from Charlie Chaplin's Modern Times. I, I think that the commentary um, of a worker in a factory in the Industrial Times can be made from the standpoint of the worker, which is valid, and it can be made from the standpoint of the structures of capitalism. And both are valid and both are important. And I think to complement what Shamir is saying uh, about um, ensuring that digital rights must reach the last person, I want to lay out the canvas on why uh, the postmodern times, you know, which wouldn't have been so postmodern, but for digital technologies, really require another Charlie Chaplin uh, take. Uh, what modern times uh, does for us is lay out a beautiful truth. The truth is, it transforms the way we look at the idea of work, the idea of leisure, the idea of relationships, and there's a fabulous shot in the movie, the idea of food. So <laughs> there is this thing, there is a machine, the capitalist design, that you know workers have to work from 9 to 5 when the factory closes, and not even a second can be given to them as free time because you, know, you have to capitalize uh, on, on the opportunity of uh, mechanized production. And therefore, they design machines where as they are working, the machine will come and give you something, and the whole machine, of course, in a very uh, Chaplinian uh, irony, it just collapses, and then, of course, hell breaks loose. I, I can see Professor Matthews laughing. It's a fabulous take. So what I want to do is start with this idea of what is the digital doing to our world? And I think it's an important point to uh, unpack also what is this our world? And our world is the need to look at the standpoints that are coming from positions of historical exclusion. And here I want to pose an important question. What do you do when the formal discourse of rights is evolving in a way that the breadth of the moral imaginary that um, Bishnu spoke about is captured by some interests? So I'm going to talk about the implications of what is happening because this moral imaginary is actually now becoming the, the prerogative, uh, if you will, of certain people. The first implication is that uh, my premise being that we live in, just like we used to live in the industrial society, uh, we live in a digital society. And by that, I don't mean to be essentialist, and I don't certainly mean that everybody has a phone and everybody has access. I mean that it's a paradigm. It's a paradigm where we wouldn't be where we are, and we wouldn't be as a society where we are, but for the fact that we also have technologies in addition to many other things, the ideologies of advanced capitalism, the ideologies of uh, you know, claiming back power, you know, which is happening in the Latin American continent, the idea that we can redefine democracy as we go along, the idea that uh, gender is not uh, an, uh, a binary, all these ideas. So technology is a very, very intrinsic part of this universe of ideas. The first implication of the digital world we live in is the fact of marketization of development being taken to the next level. Feminist uh, uh, economists and uh, critical thinkers have always talked about how the discourse of development is in the past uh, 20 years, thanks to the Washington consensus, getting marketized. But this level of marketization is the next level where there is legitimacy for this marketization. Uh, all of us um, know about the microfinance disaster that happened in Andhra Pradesh. Uh, a complete unleashing of intermediaries. Excuse me, sir. Solpa, yeah. Uh, a complete unleashing of um, you know intermediaries in the in, in the uh, rural landscape of people who would go and put enormous pressure on uh, poor women. Uh, to the extent that uh, there is documented evidence of the pressure of being unable to reti return these loans uh, telling on uh, women and therefore suicides um, in, in, in these villages. 
Now, one of the important things is that in the late 2000s, around 2009 or something, the government came in and said we have to regulate these intermediaries. Uh, because you know it, it's uh, it was the banking sector was regulated, but somehow people thought that you know somebody giving money to poor people, microfinance. I mean, why do we need to regulate it? But well, um, you know, society paid a price for it, and it was not you and me. Because you know, if uh, companies have to be bailed out, uh, Obama will do it. But when poor women are dying, then well, you know, you have to really wait, gather the evidence, and two three people have to actually verify that she is indeed dead. And then, of course, you decide to uh, regulate intermediaries. So today, we have big platforms who co corner network advantage. And network advantage, people have already spoken about this first mover advantage, et cetera. So you, you're talking about monopolies on a scale that is unprecedented. And it's not just Facebook where we may be the products, but exploitative uh, monopolies to whom the development sector is turning for solutions, Eureka. because. Uh, a friend of mine who uh, was a pioneer and who set up Sutradhar, which is selling um, early uh, childhood materials in this city, Mandira Kumar tells me that to sell something on Amazon, she has to pay 40% commission. Now, well, uh, and then there is Amazon and nothing else, right? I mean, of course, we are talking about some homegrown e-commerce platforms, but we all know that uh, platforms buy out platforms. That's why WhatsApp got bought over. Now, this is leading to an extraordinary wealth inequality, a new race to the bottom, with new narratives of enclosure and division. So people are coming there, uh, setting up shop, and then they don't even have to do very much. It's like, uh, you know, proprietary companies, they sell the software, and then after that you lease the software uh, till kingdom come, till eternity. You know, they will re keep on releasing uh, new versions, and old versions will become defunct, and therefore you have to new, uh, you know, download the new version, otherwise you're dead. Um, the problem here is the, that state authority to rein in these corporations is a big issue, and uh, people have pointed out that uh, much more than the philanthropy that Facebook and Google is doing, their tax avoidance is multiple times more than their philanthropy. So this is we have to remember that. That uh, day before yesterday, Mark Zuckerberg said that he and his wife are leaving 99% of their wealth to the future of post or posterity or future of development. Uh, but the question is, even uh, if France and England can't you know, make Google pay tax than can uh, many other countries. Uh, it's also important to know that a recent study concluded that internet companies are making enormous profits in middle-income countries. The products have mostly been developed and paid off in the richer countries. And what they're just doing is employing staff to do selling and marketing and advertising in our country. So in one example, the researcher found a company like Facebook is probably earning an 80% return on investment. So we are, what we're talking about is, in the classical uh, capitalist sense, this is expro expropriation and enclosure. And uh, you know, somebody asked me this question, and I didn't know the answer. The largest logistics company in the world is? One more guess. Google. And here I think we need to see how the Shreya single PIL on 66A needs to be seen not only as a victory for free speech, but also companies' liability for online regulation amounting to the privatization of censorship law. So you're actually sometimes saying, hey, boss, you know, all these companies, uh, you know, they are here to save our free speech. Now let's uh, allow them to decide what is good speech, bad speech, hate speech, and love speech. So, uh, but the case uh, of 66A also actually has raised concerns around the fact of what will happen when law gets, lawmaking gets privatized. The second broad point I want to talk about is how in the digital society the privatization of philanthropy on a global scale is happening in the name of partnership. And I think alliances is a very good word, but alliances is a very highly abused word today. And I think the political underpinnings of uh, vocabulary, the semantics that bind us, become all the more important, like Kalyani said. And uh, I j I'm coming just from a UN meeting, and here uh, I, uh, an Afghan minister got up. An Afghan minister got up and said this completely preposterous thing. I thought I'd fall off the chair, but he said this. He says, who says, when the private sector is sponsoring parliaments, they also have a responsibility to fund development. So I, I quite didn't understand what he was saying, till I realized that he was actually saying what I thought he was saying, that the oligarchic nexus between the private sector and uh, you know, the digital companies is actually seen as a solution. It's seen as a solution to redeem democracy of whatever 
version and however corrupt democracy may be. But the new, brave new world that we are talking about uh, is really that we have a Gates Foundation that is spending money on health. And uh, analysis actually shows you that Gates Foundation is spending money not on the largest global health killers. They're not doing that. And far from, so some analysts have said that far from being uniquely effective, these grants that are being made by the Gates Foundation do not reflect the burden of disease endured by the, those in deepest poverty. The Gates Foundation has also, and this is of concern to uh, all of us, including uh, to the points that were made in the first panel, has aggressively called for US-based multinationals such as Monsanto to gain a stronger foothold in African nations becoming the self-professed expert on redeeming African development challenges through hybrid seeds. So on the one hand, you know, uh, Gates will do a series of things and then he will call upon Monsanto in an alliance of convenience and both of them will redeem African development. So in a 2011 book chapter, Oxford Health Economist uh, Davis Tuckler and his colleagues have argued that global health is ruled by a few private donors who make decisions in secret. The capacity to decide what is relevant and how it will be addressed is in the hands of very, very few people who ultimately are accountable to themselves. So, and that, all this is coming from those who control the network uh, is no uh, big secret. So what I want to say is postmodernism was delighted to see a certain ideological nomadism replace the tyranny of binary thought. Uh, and I was quite intrigued to listen to Shitaj this morning. But what the oligarchic nexus really wants is a version of capitalism and democracy, what Shitaj called traveling rationalities. And it is a nomadism, not of multiplicity and social justice, but of a unitary vision of market mechanism as the basis of democratic social contracts. So the whole idea that market will be the default social contract is what we are seeing in this advanced uh, uh, you know, uh, marketization of development. And this is really surreal. And I'm not meaning to be you know, um, conspiratorial or anything like that. And we actually see that all, all around us to the extent that there is an emergence of a mar marketplace of politics. So change.org, I mean, at some point or the other, we have signed petitions, put petitions on change.org, but it took an activist like Kamyani uh, Bali Mahabal to tell us that, boss, change.org takes money to put certain campaigns ahead of certain others. So if you are very important, an important client to change.org, the change that the advertisement decides will be more important than the change that bottom-up people decide. So these are controversies in the emerging marketplace of politics. The th third broad point I want to make is redistribution today is replaced by win-win partnerships. And this is a hacking by capitalism into meaning making into truth regimes. And I'm very glad the truth regime regimes was mentioned earlier. And at the first level, what does this mean? This hacking by capitalism into meaning making and a new significations, new truths. At the first level, it is the idea of a multi-stakeholderism. Everybody is a stakeholder and everybody can participate in the problem solving. But actually, nobody is really accountable to anybody. And this is a you know, mass scale privatization of policy making. One of the things that has been pointed out recently by the Indian Cellular Association is that Modi's national intellectual property right policy, which is in a draft form and will be tabled next year, uh, in that the recommendations part of that framework has been done by the senior advocate to Ericsson, Pratibha Singh. So she is sitting, Ericsson is, you know, is sitting inside the policy making on intellectual property rights. And others have pointed out that Ericsson is anyway, you know, is uh, 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 you're making stuff in China. How is it that it's wanting to enforce pa patent rights in, in India? Um, at the second level, what this win-win does is promote a neoliberal version of self-governance. So there is this entire, you know, Uber, whatever, whatever, you can share, I can share, sharing economy. But in the meanwhile, someone else is making the money and going away. So all of us in Bangalore who were delighted with Uber know very well that suddenly you started having to pay some, you know, peak hour charge, then some random charge, various charges. And once, you know, a ride which cost me 200 rupees, I confidently put my parents in a cab and sent them and they paid 650 rupees. And, you know, I was taken aback. So the intermediaries really are not regulated. And uh, uh, it, it's a problem on two counts. One is recently 
the labor ministry in Karnataka has said that these taxis will be, uh, transport uh, department has said that these cabs will be regulated. And not long ago, about a month ago, the Uber taxi drivers went on strike saying that the incentives that were promised to them didn't materialize at all. So who is making the money? Now, the other thing I heard in this conference that I was part of yesterday and day before were civil society people standing up and singing peons and using words, which again, you know, if the previous remarks uh, made me fall off the chair, this I really thought I will faint. They used the word Facebook Republic. And another word, please, hold on, hold your breath. Google United Nations. I'm like, <laughs> boss, Republic, Facebook Republic, then we really, really, really need to have this you know, alliance here of thinking through what rights and freedoms are and what are the means of making them and how, you know, since they're unhinged from the whole social contract and sought to be made atavistic, you know, when Shitaj was talking about that Magna Carta which was signed between el elites, don't worry, we are back to those atavistic times and contracts are being made between the elite. And here, there is a huge silencing. And how is this huge silencing achieved? It's achieved because this, uh, this ideological nomadism, you know, that is go doing the rounds, is making sure that civil society is bought. So every other new age digital rights NGO is sponsored by, you know, so I don't want to say more. And therefore, freedoms are very welcome. One of the taglines of these very big companies is, you know, we care very much about your freedoms. So the question that Kalyani would tell me to ask, you know, coming from the feminist movement is, remember, you know, who is standing up for your rights matters as much, of what, as, much as what rights they are standing up for. So which are these interests promoting these freedoms is really important. So uh, asking if the digital technology can help NREGA is important, but more important is what kind of internet is being made available, what is a digital oligarchic nexus, and what the network data complex is doing to our moral imaginary of rights. The fourth issue I want to talk about, and I just have four and five, so this is the last but one, the big data regime and the network data complex and its role in creating and promoting new myths of development. You know, uh, we all live in a world where we are taught what the development problem is. And the, it's extremely hard, uh, you know, uh, Shabrish is my colleague from the Mysore unit where we do work with communities. And uh, we do extremely pertinent work, we believe, and we are collectivizing communities to stand up for their rights, all their rights, including the rights to technology. And it's so hard for us to persuade uh, donors to believe that that work is important. And that is not an accident. Um, uh, you know, recently there was this Facebook, uh, what is that, real name policy, that authentic name uh, policy controversy. And for uh, those who don't know, Facebook has this rule that it's a real name system where how you configure your user profile, etc., you have to be real. So you have to give your real name, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Otherwise, I mean, you violate their terms and conditions, uh, about which anyway you can make no sense when you're saying, I agree. So Facebook's real name policy is really about data collection and advertising. And the more Facebook knows about you, the more you will become nothing but a unit of uh, data, which is being sold to data aggregators. So let's not forget, as someone recently said, data is the new oil. It's the new means of colonization. Or another good one that someone recently said, in God we trust, but the rest of us will have to bring data. So in the era of choice and diversity, data patterns, which are collections of society, become very important. And ironically, this is disciplining consumption, which has been held up by capitalism as the final frontier for exercising choice and becoming empowered. So consumers' consumption is being disciplined in a Foucauldian sense. The second is, uh, in data itself, is the whole mining of development data. And recently, I read a beautiful case study of New York citizens standing up against data mining by two big companies. One is Bill Gates, the other is Rupert Murdoch. And this was happening of children's behavior, ch children in public schools. All the data of children in public schools in New York is being documented by In Bloom Incorporated where Carnegie Corporation, Rupert Murdoch, Bill Gates, all of them have gotten into the public school system and, of course, into the minds of young people. Um, the last uh, under big data I want to talk about, which is really scary, is uh, the, the business of measurement in the SDGs, in the Sustainable Development Goals. All the goals 
uh, civil society uh, commentators have pointed out is that you absolutely don't have any measures for poverty or anything of the structural dimensions. So you have some random measures like, you know, number of people with uh, pakka roofs or whatever, whatever, but you really don't have any w way to measure inequality. There are some weak indicators to measure inequality inside within countries, but no indicator at all to measure inequality between countries. So this is about the new players. This is about Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data, which is a multi-stakeholder initiative launched in September 2015. And these are the new authorities that Shitij was talking about, without any authority, without any legitimate authority, but self-proclaimed rulers of the universe with the power of data that are going to actually dictate what kind of SDGs will be implemented in your country and mine. So the last one, therefore, I uh, want to say is the point on governance and democracy and what somebody has called the accountability creep, like mission creep. The accountability creep is very simple. So even without digitization and transparency, you know, in the olden days, Anganwadi workers used to gather data, health workers used to gather data, and all this data, you know, would be, they would sit and uh, all of us have uh, gone on many of these marches, etc., to support these workers by saying that, you know, they're being loaded and loaded like the school teacher, average school teacher in rural areas to do election work, to do all these work and copious documentation. But at least in those days, these da data was uh, documented like this. Today, every panchayat has been given a diktat that they have to digitize. Why have they to digitize? Because data has to travel up. All the mission mode programs have to be, uh, you know, they have to be monitored very well. And therefore, the data that is traveling up, and we know this very well from our work in Mysore, is completely fudged. Just because, you know, you have a computer there and somebody is entering the data doesn't mean the data is... So imagine the data is going to travel up and somebody is going to outsource all this big data to companies which will give you back the truth based on which our planners and policy makers will decide what to do back there in that village. So we are going to live in this bubble of a kind of development based on evidence where the evidence process itself is based on something that's highly uh, flawed. And here I really remember what Professor Babu Matthew said in the terms of right to food. Now, if we, ha we have this measure of how much you know, we need to eat every day, then our estimation of food stocks should be based on you know, that particular benchmark, however you know, flawed that might be, or you know, it, it, it may be a rough consensus. Now, there is no debate in the country about uh, what kind of internet people need. There is some broad assumption that you know, give them mobiles, with the assumption that they will then subscribe to some mobile internet. The women we work with don't even have a dumb phone, and if they have a phone, it is a dumb phone. Nobody has internet on mobiles. The whole idea that they're going to have data plans, boy, I mean, that's like some mythical imagination. And in this, uh, there are many pilots, you know, people come and give it to them for three months, etc., and that's it. Now, the problem is that we say by various estimations that about 19% of India uses the internet. But one very important thing that C.P. Chandrasekhar has written about is it's only 3% of Indian households that have access to a computer at home, household level access. Now what I think we need to think about is when we go through our NSS surveys and our census surveys, we should ask the question, do you have a computer, which I think we ask in the census. The thing is, if you're talking about e-government service access at the household level, imagine only 3% have a computer at home. So what is it doing to all this open data that we are putting out or the government is supposedly putting out and that citizens are supposedly accessing? 3% households, so where are uh, people's rights and what does it mean for the uh, poorest? So um, now we have free basics. Somebody came up and gave us free basics, so we are very, very delighted. But from the standpoint of equality of autonomy, some people are first-class citizens, and the others who get free basics are a ghetto, because free basics is nothing but a zenana, sending back some people into the privatized enclosure that you will you deserve to get an internet that is dumbed down. So I want to end by saying that for me, the concerns, and for our society for change, the concerns uh, around the new social contract uh, actually embody three very important pegs. First is, can we move towards an idea of digital citizenship as an individual and collective capability? And a collective capability because we don't want 
uh, the modern times repeating, you know, the irony of the modern times. And we really want to go with the promise that Shamir uh, talked about, that there should be an alternative commons, that there should be cooperativism, that cooperatives should be governing a taxi service like Uber. I mean, it's not difficult at all because all that labor is there and all those taxi drivers can put up a simple dashboard and use publicly available GIS data, perhaps. I mean, maybe I'm oversimplifying things and there are others who might know better, but certainly to envision this. The second is how can we give legitimacy for a new ethics of a network society where we can think about democratic governance of intermediation, data governance, and things uh, about which uh, forget, you know, uh, the, the spirit of the law and, you know, the de jure and the de facto rights, etc. There is absolutely no debate. There is absolutely nothing on paper. There is nothing formal. And that is the scary part, that, that consensus is not allowed to be built because there is this kind of uh, ideological nomadism that's traveling around the world and creating this feeling that you already have freedoms, you know, uh, go back and sign up for more accounts online and you will have more freedoms. Now the third and the last and the most important thing is what kind of alliances do we need? Now here I think we have to be very discerning because, uh, you know, when uh, Siddharth introduced himself and said he's a political activist, I think that civil society means something. You know, and therefore, I think people in the business of talking about uh, rights in the digital age, uh, I think we may have our differences from the points or standpoints we are representing and coming from, but certainly we can't have been bought by the oligarchic nexus. Thank you.